We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Valerie. My name is Noj Sat. I'm coming from Iraq. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Youth Development Foundation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Rashad Sanusi from Benin. I serve as Communication Official for Internet Society Benin Chapter. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jose Fisakadudban. I'm the General Coordinator of Chad Youth IEF and Focal Point of Youth IEF Africa. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Shadra Kankra from Ghana, and I am the, a member of the Ghana Youth IGF Stereo Committee. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Mayad Adil from Sudan, human rights defender, doctor, Many things. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jackie Akello. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya, and I'm a member of the IGF uh, Youth Ambassadors. Thank you. Hello, everyone. A uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is Innocent Adrico, and I'm from Uganda. I coordinate the Uganda Youth IGF. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Carson Gabriel. I'm from Tanzania and the founder and director of the Emerging Youth Initiative. So thank you so much, everyone. And I'd like to know from your context, what does encryption mean to you? In one word, Arthur. Safety. It, uh, it means life for me. Confidence for me. Security. Protection. Transparency. Privacy. I would say protection. Freedom. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to give the mic to Innocent and take us through encryption and human rights, especially in the context of being a Uganda human rights defender. Tell us more about encryption and human rights in your context. All right, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, it is evident that uh, the digital age has come with so many challenges. That is the issue of, of course, uh, freedoms that are being infringed, mostly by, uh, I would say, state actors, because most of the human rights defenders are being followed up by state actors. The freedoms of expression uh, uh, and even access to information sometimes, yeah, open, uh, when I talk about, for example, perspectives of open data. And uh, some of these groups are the most, okay, I would say the most affected groups are human rights defenders and journalists. So when we talk about of, uh, encryption, uh, the way our colleagues have said encryption means a lot to them, security and all that protection. So encryption comes in to try and uh, bridge up the gap, yeah? If a journalist, if a human rights defender is able to securely communicate and uh, uh, someone's not able to maybe tap their information or they're able to, to safeguard their information and data from some of these uh, uh, particular actors who'd like to access this data. And then it makes them safe. It makes them secure as everyone, uh, every young person here has just said. So the concept basically uh, is to look at uh, how encryption can be able to bridge the gap uh, that uh, the, the, the challenges that have come with the, the digital age have created. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Kaisen, why encryption? Why is it important to you? Thank you for that. It's interesting what my colleague here, Innocent, said. Uh, for me, encryption is more of a tool. It's like when you're home in your own room, you're most free, the best version of yourself. That's why you get there. You don't need to let, lock the door, but you're safeguarding your reality and your identity. So encryption and human rights really correlates with who you are as a person characteristically and how you plan yourself to be out there. So it's just not about the data. It speaks to you as a person and as a significant member of society. 
So encryption on the internet today, which are virtual extensions of ourselves, is something that can safeguard our own identities as well as our modes of expression that we are able to correlate with the society that we are in. So for me, it's really important having that level of freedom, knowing that it is safeguarded with the ownership that one has. Thank you so much. And Jackie, over to you. Why is encryption important? I know you're doing some research on it. And why should we have young people adding their voices to this conversation? Thank you so much for that, Valerie. So my point ties to what um, Kaysan was saying. So uh, with encryption, you get to realize that all other rights are protected because um, the right to privacy is tied to it. The right to freely express yourself is tied to it and the right to associate is tied to it. So if communication or other transactions are not protected, um, people will not be able to freely express themselves online or even to communicate because they, um, they fear that their communication is being intercepted by other third parties and also encryption also ties to democracy because without encryption um actually people cannot freely express themselves on how they feel that things should be run so they go hand in hand and i feel like it should not be interfered with or rather it should not be affected or rather intercepted thank you thank you moving to the landscape in uganda Arthur, tell us more about encryption um, we, we thank you very much, Valerie. We have an Access to Information Act uh, in Uganda, and it's one of those laws that I think was crafted with uh, the best minds uh, available. It provides for a lot of, uh, it has a lot of provisions through which information can be accessed. And one of them, or, and then there are three provisions of information that you cannot touch. One of them is uh, one regarding privacy. Uh, I think that was done in the spirit that people needed to have their own space. So if we have provisions of the law where privacy is guaranteed and yet state, in, state information is provided for, then I think it really meant well. Now, if we open it up, then you, you restrict the performance of, of how people behave and how they relate with uh, democracy. Thank you so much. And we've seen that when you break encryption, you can't break it on one side only. Rashad, maybe over to you. What do you think about encryption and what we're seeing now? For me, when we are talking about encryption, it is very important and it helps people to feel more secure online. So it's we have to promote technique of encryption everywhere we are so more people can get online and be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear more from Nojus. Tell us more about encryption. Thank you, Valerie. So just to put it in simple words, encryption is about you know, people's rights to privacy, to safety, and also security offline and online, not just only online. You know, it's about our privacy, the privacy of the text messages that are stored in our smartphones, for example. It's about our medical records that are stored in the hospital software devices. And also it's about our banking information, you know, that are stored in our mobile phones. So it affects our most essential daily lives and that we get, you know, the services that we get from the digital technologies and all of us, must not only we should have the right for, for the encryption to be protected, but also we should have a say in this protection. So it's really important for young people and the civil society to get more involved in the encryption, especially you know, coming from a country where the government is like the sole dominant force that is you know, governing the internet. So I believe that it is like a, a huge human rights violation for the civil society and the other actors to not get involved in the governance. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we'd like to listen a bit more from Meada. Tell us more about encryption being a human rights defender. Sorry, the situation in Sudan, basically, we're lacking the encryption right. We're lacking the freedom of expression. Uh, um, I, I join my voices to him that civil society should do the work uh, on behalf of the government because the government obviously keep violating the human right by violating the encryption right. Um, uh, our government basically work on limiting the rights of uh, the population, especially after Kutita that we have on the 25th of October. Um, it's, it's, it's a work of a young uh, uh, tech uh, digital activist and researcher to, to, to obtain this right, but we, we, we cannot trust the government because, it, because of the viol continuous violation of rights. Thank you so much. And now Shadrach, being a youth convener in terms of the IGF, what would you say about encryption and how young people can contribute in this space? Okay, thank you for 
the opportunity. So um, I would basically uh, um, talk about encryption uh, in the context of um, advocacy and the underprivileged community. So talking about encryption in Ghana, we have this um, data protection at 2000 that at 843 being in existence, but these actually uh, um, do not um, 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 open the window for those who are less privileged. And as you are in the digital world, most people now use uh, smart devices because of uh, Momo, uh, Momo, that the mobile money transaction. Now people are able to use um, smartphones to transact business because of um, this uh, 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 means of making, uh, sending money. So people are now using this and also social media, but then they, they do not know about privacy and encryption, anything. So they do not know about uh, a PGP, that's a pretty, a pretty good privacy. They, they send emails, they go online, send messages, but they don't know anything about how to use these encryption tools to does encrypt their communication between each other. So I would like the youth and the civil society to really uh, do more in the uh, 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 um, area of encryption so that they will create more awareness about this for people to be aware that their data, their information can be uh, 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 um, hugged or leaked when they are online. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I'm moving back to you, Jackie, especially now because Kenya is moving into an election year. Why do you think encryption is important in the context of a country like Kenya? Okay, um, encryption is very important because um, it protects uh, people's ways of expressing themselves to particularly uh, government practices. So what I'd like to add is that there's no way the government can break encryption and prevent unauthorized third parties from um, accessing people's communication. So once you break <laughs> encryption, um, it means that you've provided access to unauthorized parties to access people's private communication and it also affects security in a very big way. So I think right now, um, now that we're in an election period, I think encryption is something that should be highly safeguarded so as to um, enable democratic processes to go on as they should. Thank you. All right, thank you. And now I'll give it to Kuzeifi. Um, give us your voice on encryption. Thank you. Okay, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, as I said, it's uh, encryption is about uh, securing uh, digital data so globally we should promote like secure and sustainable access to internet thank you thank you so much and i'd now like to hear from kaisan the linkage between encryption and human rights as we speak today tell us more about that uh, there's a role that corporations should play in terms of having encryption open at a standard that's available to each and everybody that they can understand. We are here as a multi-stakeholder approach with government, corporations, and civil society. We see EU has a standard about data protection, which is really interesting. I think coming to that realization, they set some sort of a global standard where we could all pivot from that. Because in the end of the day, our data is our own. It's your data. But in being pragmatic about data, you should understand that there's some levels, even speaking from a legal perspective, there's some levels where you should not uh, be selfish about that data. You know, you have to protect it, but you have to reach some sort of a synergy so you can, you can kind of create more better and inclusive policies. So at a human rights point of view, corporations should uh, be more open in the encryption standards that they have, but there should be higher investment in creating independent thinkers and a labor force that actually understands their rights on encryption. Meaning that you can bring your own encryption, but do you understand what encryption really means? And now we are pivoting to em emerging technologies with quantum computing. Well, it will be very easy to break all the mathematical algorithms that have been existing before. But also we have solutions like blockchain, but the normal user doesn't understand. It comes at a privilege point of view where only some brand of the population understands that. So for us as young people here at this panel, we should cascade this message at a personal institutional level, at a corporation institution level, and at a government institution level, rather than uh, saying 
that we have these problems and these, let's find ways and channels to create synergies and how we can cascade this message to all the multi-stakeholder approach, because that will be the only way where we can work in creating sort of a plain level field where encryption has to be equal for all, because if EU has the best encryption in Africa doesn't have it, I don't think that's quite equal. And I don't think that's quite fair. So I think it's more we should work together because data is global and it's universal. And it's about time that we create some sort of a level playing field that each and every citizen of the world, it's the internet united, as we say, each and everybody should understand their rights, be savvy enough to protect them. And most importantly, take ownership of your data and all the skills you have and protect each other. At the end of the day, we are our brother's keepers. Yes, Meada. I have a question for him. So uh, taking it from theoretical to practical, how about the authoritarian government targeting the human rights defenders and activists or independent thinkers under the law of threatening the national security? That's why they, they violate the right and the encryption right of the defenders. What do you say about that? How we can target it practically? Uh, how we can encrypt or save the human rights defenders from those authoritarian governments? Systems, processes, and institutions are really important in this matter. We need to know how it goes. Because if I'm violated right now in Tanzania saying my data has been abused, I do not know where to go. But I do have someone who might understand where I should go. So it's important we set standards which are really open in nature and which are really pragmatic in how we could, uh, you, you know, how we could report it and how it could create impact. You know, for something to be meaningful, it needs to be attached to a certain kind of purpose. And that purpose is driven by a community consensus, a street consensus. So a brand of activists needs to come together. If you can unify and have a consolidate message it's way better than being alone. So if I have a problem in Tanzania right now, and I say, my friend, Innocent, can you help my brother In out? Sudan as well. Yeah, yeah, and in Sudan as well. And I can say, can you help me out? I believe that they can speak from my perspective. They can speak from my agenda because they know Karsa not as a Tanzanian or not as a leader of this. They know me as a person. So if I'm standing for the rights of encryption for each and everybody and each and every youth, it's easy that my message can be passed through him. It's important to unify and create these correlations of impact together as young people and as internet leaders here. That's a responsibility that we need to have and fight for. Thank you so much. And now um, I couldn't help but listen to Kai when you talked about the GDPR and what the EU has done. And I even know that in Kenya, we have a Data Protection Act. But what's interesting is that in Uganda, we have the Regulation for Interception of Communications Act as well. So let's hear more about that from Ata and how it affects encryption. Well, thank you, uh, Valerie. The Regulation of Interception of Communications Act uh, 2010, in short form known as the Phone Tapping uh, Act, was a law that was pushed through by the politicians to ensure that they blocked out competitors from uh, vying for top office. And what this law effectively did was to provide for the state to legally tap all communications uh, going over telecommunication channels. So while we're here talking about the need to discuss encryption, we have instances where a law was actually passed that made it legal for the state to listen into all your communications. So maybe we need to include in conversations how we can try to have some of these laws repealed and maybe we can champion this from a young person's perspective or push it on to civil society and see that maybe some of these anti-progress laws can be repealed because as we speak, it's still in force. And I know personally know some people who have actually fallen victim to this law. Thank you so much. And when I talk about our government and government intervention, maybe you can move it to Innocent and tell us more about how we can ensure that the discussions we make here at the AGF make sense and make sense to our governments and to our context. All right, thank you very much, moderator. I'll just as last time I talked about the fact that uh, governments are the ones letting us down. We as young people talk a lot here, but for example, right now, I don't think uh, there's a government of official inside here, but still 
uh, we have a regional and national IGFs. We usually talk a lot about these issues. But whenever you are uh, talking about these issues, the representatives you have on ground actually show you that they are willing to work with the young people to address some of these challenges. But unfortunately, when they step out of the venue, it's a different story. When you go to their offices, it's a different story. So the question is, how do we get governments to do what has been agreed upon here? How do we get governments to know the right thing, not what they think? Because uh, I feel like uh, they, they do it more of, uh, in terms of politics, of course. We know how African politics is, for example. Why I like to use Africa is because our politics is a bit messed up. Like someone can just feel like, okay, this human rights defender is a threat to me being uh, the president or the, the, the minister. So I need to shut him down. That is why uh, a number of competent legislators are going to sit down and agree that we should be tapping uh, phone calls. Forgetting that they are going to be part of the people affected by such kind of uh, policies and laws that they have put in place, yeah? We've seen, for example, in Uganda, a number of them falling victim. I mean, it's not that every time you're going to be on the right side, there's a day you're going to be on the other side. It might not be the wrong side, but it might be the opposite side, yeah? So maybe they should understand that it's not about who is against me, but it's about what is right. So all I can ask us as young people to do is that, uh, Kaysen already talked about uh, Collaboration, yeah, if he has a problem in Tanzania, if Mayada there has a problem in Sudan, how do we as young people, the global youth, see that she is her? The internet is very powerful. The COVID has already proved that. I mean, our voices can be heard and there's always someone who will come out to help. So I normally call it making noise. I love making noise on the internet because for what is right, noise has to be made. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Innocent, for that contribution. And um, I'd like to move across the table once more and to just listen to how can young people plug into the issue of encryption and human rights. We've already seen the work being done by the Internet Society in terms of encryption and trying to build capacity by writing blogs and engaging other groups. We've seen what's happening globally with the encryption network and alliances. We're even seeing the work that is being done by Mallory Nodel on encryption. So maybe across the table, if I start with you, Nojus, how do you think young people can plug into empowerment in terms of understanding what encryption is and how it affects us? Yeah, thank you, Valerie. So just before I get that, I would like to talk a little bit, like give you some context about how encryption is in my country. So actually encryption and cybersecurity is like, it's extremely poor because like it's managed, as I mentioned, only it's governed only by the government. And there is no space for the other actors to get involved at all. So for example, like there is a, like a new cybersecurity law that went into effect like a few months ago. So it, it literally like imposed heavy prison, I mean, prison sentences and also hefty, I mean, fines against peaceful critics and activists, you know, who express themselves online. So it ranged from, you know, murdering them or kidnapping them to destroying their lives and families. So it's like, a, it's a devastating, you know, setback for the, I mean, freedom of expression and, and the human rights violation. So I think like the answer to that, I mean, to the answer to the question of how can we like, you know, I mean, hold governments accountable is, is, is it like a massive civil society educational campaign? We need that. We need to educate people about their own rights and how encryption is affecting their lives. For example, you know, as an activist for healthcare and gender equality, I have like a few examples. I want to talk about some issues that are very prevalent in my country and also in other countries as well. So for example, I mean, encryption is not only about our, it's not, oh, not only about human rights, but it's also about, you know, our health the health and rights of, you know, adults and women, young people and, and marginalized communities. Because, you know, uh, it literally, it's about protecting our lives from abuse, from exploitation and even murder. And that's why I chose the life. I mean, the word life. For example, talking from my gender equality perspective. So there's like a lot of cases of, you know, honorable killing, especially of girls and women in my country that, you know, and also it, it was like due to, I mean, decoding or decryption. De 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 because like their data has been like leaked, leaked and they had you know been exposed to honorable killing and all the types of you know uh, human rights violation especially of lgbtq individuals as well especially if their identities get leaked or, or talking from a mental health perspective you know and how it affects young people for example you know there have been like a lot of suicide cases because you know, young people's data have been leaked and 
you know, this society will bully them and judge them and also they will lead to mental health violations. So that's another, I mean, extremely important factor that we need to educate people about. So yeah, I do believe, you know, uh, encryption is life and people should know about that. And also when it comes to, uh, you know, us, our, our role as young people, we have to organize, you know, start with like this, like, like an IGF, you know, in our own countries. We have to start in the local levels, go to the national levels, you know, to hold governments accountable and also hold these international. This should be like an international uh, cybersecurity um, alliance that will hold governments accountable to their, you know, responsibilities when it comes to encryption in their countries. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Valerie. Uh, I would like to add to what my colleagues say that we need to educate more people uh, in the uh, internet society in chapter. We are trying to do this with uh, giving tips to people at all level. So I will add that uh, we can do it also in our local language so more people can get more knowledge about encryption and they can be safe online. Thank you. Okay, and I think it must be like a global commitment where all multi-stakeholders must get involved in order to offer more effective and efficient solutions. Thank you. Okay, so to just add up, um, I would say we have to really advocate for encryption as um, the Internet Society Ghana chapter, uh, we did, uh, I think uh, two months now, we had um, a regional awareness program about encryption, which was uh, uh, um, submitted to the Internet Society for the chapter 10 this year. So we should um, go down um, to the underrepresented communities. If maybe the government are not really helping us do that, we should move there and do it. Because many people, many local people use the internet nowadays, but they don't know about the dangers of them using their devices. For instance, someone can just record uh, um, his or her nakedness on a device, and maybe the device gets uh, um, uh, uh, spot. The person tries to send it to for, to repairs. Not today. the person might think um, he or she has deleted that information, but the repairer can just uh, go into the maybe uh, uh, recycle bin and just see this information. But then if you encrypt such data, it will be hard for these persons to have access to your data and black, uh, blackmail you or something. So thank you, that's all. Um, uh, a part of recommendation, I think we share all the similar problems with our governments and, and, uh, and I, I agree with most of what they have said, but I, I could add, some of recommendation for civil society and its donor, that the NGO should press the government to guarantee the right for encryption and the freedom to internet. As most of those countries are signed the, the law binding treaties of the, uh, the public, uh, sorry, for the, uh, for the ICCPR, uh, which is the International Convention of the uh, Public and Civil Rights. And also uh, most of our African countries signed the human charter for, uh, for the people's right. Uh, so it's a low binding treaties and, 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 and from there we can start to, to pressure uh, our governments. Uh, also to urge the governments to, to be transparent with the telecom companies by letting them publish connectivity data uh, like other in international ISP. Also provide trainings for people of human rights defenders on network measurements tools. And we should know that we, there is not enough data in the telecom sector in Sudan. So there is a real need to collect more data. We should also train the human rights defenders on how to document the human rights violations during the network disturbance, like the net shutdowns by the authoritarian governments. Um, for our government, as we said, we don't have a government officials to, to, to have a confrontational discussion with them, but we would like to this government keep the internet connectivity and, 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 and other, any other forms of connection safe for people. Um, the legal reforms should be uh, advocated also for the civil society and human rights defender and also the digital activist. Um, basically, that's what I can add. Thank you. Mm.
Thank you so much for that. So to add on to what everyone else has said, I think the first um, step in ensuring that encryption is protected is creating awareness. You get to realize that most people in society <coughs> actually don't know what encryption entails. So I think the first step um, in dealing with this is creating awareness uh, to show them what, right, what rights are at stake. Then the next step after this is now participation in the policymaking process. Now, um, participation ensures that actually encryption is protected and all the rights tied to it are also protected in the process. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to talk about, for example, what we've done as digital security trainers. I happen to be a digital security trainer in Uganda. So what we did to cover up the, the awareness gap, uh, we developed a digital security curriculum. So it, it has a, a topic on encryption. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we are able to train like journalists. So the curriculum basically focuses on journalists and, uh, and human rights defenders. So we train these people on how they can secure their devices and then their communications, the, like of course the, the normal hardware they have, like for, for example, flash disks, how they can encrypt them. And then their email communications and all that. And then all the other uh, types of communications that they use like uh, uh, among themselves or maybe with other stakeholders. So yeah, and it's giving fruit. So uh, it's good to have that these people, uh, uh, these people actually understand how they can protect their devices, how they can protect themselves. Uh, like from, uh, for example, maybe if uh, the, there's theft of uh, a device, they are very sure that maybe that device can't be accessed. Yeah. So that that gives you that security that we're talking about. Gives you that protection that we're talking about. Also, of course, uh, the summer has already talked about pressing the government. We need to see that governments really understand that it is two-sided, yeah? Government side and uh, civil society side, yeah? Whereas, uh, of course, we, we are not against the government being able to control sometimes, uh, for example, misinformation, which is always their challenge that sometimes causes uh, maybe violence and something. The government needs to understand that human rights defenders are there uh, not to be against them, but to see that everything is being checked. Like governments need to be checked. If the government wants to be independent, then who is going to check you? Like who is going to tell you this is wrong and this is right? Because that is what we need to know. Like government needs to accept that we did this wrong. Maybe next time we should do it this way. Yeah, thank you. Decentralize and equalize. We need to decentralize this central parameters that actually control and actually create forms of technologies. In terms of digital literacies, we should equalize globally so everybody can understand what encryption is and what it means to them. And for the ones creating these standards, the technical community, it's easy for us to also equalize it that everybody has access to it because that's how we will create a self-regulating society because in the end, few corporations still own the most advanced technologies with AI and all the emerging technologies. We are the pawn, digital colonialism will come and we will be the pawns. So it's important when we are able to understand and take ownership of our own data and actually secure ourselves because we are, security, we are securing our own identities and the future of humanity. Big brother is always watching, so be careful. All right, thank you so much. And thank you for being part of this lightning talk with us. Again, my name is Valerie Yega, I've been your moderator. And my plea would be to continue the conversation in, on encryption at your local levels and also engaging your regional levels and even at the international level. Thank you everyone and thank you panelists for coming. Thank you. <laughs>